Welcome to Paul vs. Destin, the show where Paul and I talk about various topics, things from the industry. Sometimes we have a friend. This time it's just Paul and I. Anyway, on today's show, we're going to talk about the recent Halo Infinite reveal. We're going to talk about uh, some comments from Sean Layden. We're going to talk about Xbox and PS5 sales and maybe a few other things that we wind up on. Let's get into it right now. Yeah, Paul, I'm not doing the fatalities anymore. They take way not, too not, long. We're not to getting into it now to the death. Okay. <laughs> no, no more to the death. That's supposed to be That's sort okay. of fun, though. So uh, I'm sure you watched it. Both of us just finished watching the uh, the Halo Infinite crazy reveal uh, for multiplayer. I suppose by the time this airs, because these errors air on Sunday, I'll have played it. You'll probably have played it, right? Well, okay, <laughs> so I may have forgotten to apply to uh, get my invitation until uh, after they were being sent out. And they were very nice about it. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, like you missed the boat on this one. We'll get you to the next one. But I, I appreciate them at least like not laughing in my face about it because <laughs> um, but that was definitely my fault. So I'll have to live vicariously through you, I guess. <laughs> well, what did you think about what you saw today? Do you think it's going to be a good uh, game, basically multiplayer I game? Yeah, I, I do. I think, I mean, they've taken their time with this. I think they, I think in Halo 5, they understood 90% of like the core of what made good Halo multiplayer. And I, th I think that was much improved from Halo 4 in the first place. So if they just keep building on that and kind of uh, evolve it in the way they seem to be, I, I think it's going to be a big hit. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever fully get back to like the glory days of like Halo 2 and 3 and stuff like that. And yet like, Clearly, it's going to be kind of a massive success for them, and it is not shaping up to be, like, nothing they're showing now is is worrisome, I guess. Like, yeah, a year ago, we were in a different place, but now everything they're showing is, like, kind of deeply impressive, so. So, watching the multiplayer reveal, they they were very clear that we're going to be fighting bots. Uh, do you think that's a good way to go? Kind of. I mean, I kind of miss the days of bots. Like, you, you rarely see them anymore, but I think that's kind of a good way to kind of test the waters here, and then... Um, I, I think in the final version of the game, it'll it'll open up kind of accessibility a lot more broadly than we've seen before. And I'm, I'm sure bot AI has come a long way since I was using it in Perfect Dark on N64. Uh, so I'm I'm really I'm looking forward to kind of trying that out and seeing how that goes, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, when they show the gun range and everything like that, I, I remarked that I think it's really cool that they're going to have areas on each of the characters for hit detection to show you, like, how well you're aiming. Like if I'm doing all body shots, I'm like, okay, I got to like move my cursor up a little bit or just make sure I'm hitting the appropriate, you know, place for the most damage, which is in the head in all these games. So I'm pretty stoked about it. I, I am obviously I unabashedly, I have for a long time been excited about Halo Infinite. How dare you? Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, I'm really, really excited to see what they do here. They've been so clear. Like a few days ago, the, the blog post came out where they were very clear and they said, hey, this is early. It's like a two month. Well, in the sh in the stream today, they said it's a two month old build. I thought in the blog post they said it was a one month old. But um, basically, it's an old build. They're probably going to have problems. There's going to be like uh, outages and crashes and things like that. And uh, for me, I'm managing my expectations. So I'm like, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've played early games before. They're often messy. Like I remember when Gears launched and I was like, oh, man, this looks so bad. And then it came out and it looked way better, <laughs> like way, way, way better. But this is this is basically locked and uh, I'm stoked to get in there and play. I really liked what I saw today. I like the key binding options. I know that might sound silly, but that's actually really important to me. I like that they have multiple slots for each one. I like um all the options like FOV slider. Remember when Destiny added that on console? Everybody was super stoked. Game changing. It's yeah. a much bigger deal than you'd imagine. So <laughs> yeah, and until you've used stuff like that, you don't really uh, uh, get how it sort of changes how much information that you're getting in the game and what the game feels like. Like if you have max FOV in Destiny, at least it feels like you're moving faster. I I don't know. That's weird to say, but uh, yeah. No, it does because it's a perception thing. Like. You know, you can watch a video on YouTube where it's like it's a shot of a train going and then they change the FOV and it just it changes the perceived speed immediately. Like it's it's a very noticeable effect and it's it's good that they're using that as a feature for sure. 
Well, let's not spend too much time on Halo because we'll be playing it by the time this video comes out. Let's talk about uh, this quote from Sean Layden, uh, which was a little weird. So here's what he said. It's very hard to launch a $120 million game on a subscription service charging $9.99 a month. You pencil it out. You're going to have to have 500 million subscribers before you start to recoup your investment. And I was like, okay, $9.99 a month times the current 18 million that we know they have is $179 million a month. With Sean Layden's calculation, $9.99 a month times 500 million is $4.9 billion a month. What game? Like, I don't understand this math here. I'm very confused by this statement. What do you, what do you, what do you think the point is that he's trying to make? Cause I'm, I'm is, at a bit he of a talk, loss. Maybe he's talking about like the whole pool of like hundred million dollar games that they have to make. I, I, I don't know. Cause like, yeah, cause but the even average, then I'm the average game is a hundred million dollars. Yeah. But I, I feel like he has a point here. But I'm very confused about why he says, like, why do you need 500 million subscribers? That's $4.9 billion. Is he saying, well, if I look at every game on the service and assume they all cost $100 million to make, you need $4.9 billion? Like, I don't, I know. don't know. <laughs> I, I can't, like, I don't understand his math. I understand the point he's at least trying to make, even if he got the math wrong. As someone who frequently gets math wrong, I can <laughs> empathize with that, but... I think he's trying to, and Sony, Sony has said this in no uncertain terms um, before where they just don't believe that you can like it. They, they think it is too risky for them to give up like, you know, uh, $60 box copies. If you're going to sell 10 million, 50 million copies of the last of us two or whatever at $70 a pop now on PS five, like to give that up in favor of just offering everything for a subscription for 10 bucks a month. And like, this is why, you know, the, the Game Pass meme is, is so prevalent because it just seems like such a good deal and you're getting all of the stuff that would normally be costing you full price. Like two, you know, two PS5 games is, you know, a year of Game Pass, depending on what tier you're on. Like, that's that's pretty wild. And, I, like, the, the big mystery is, like, is Game Pass profitable? How profitable is it if it's profitable? And, like, can any other company actually get away with this besides Microsoft? And like because of their size, so you could say like, okay, Google and Amazon could, but Google and Amazon aren't making <laughs> any good games to even like put in a subscription. I mean, maybe Amazon's going to have New World now, but that's about it. Whereas Sony, like Sony, relies so heavily on these massive sales of these like must-have single-party games that I, I, they would be risking everything to go toe to toe with a competitor they're already beating, like in terms of console sales at mm -hmm. least. So. I, I just don't think they think that's worth the risk. And like, I assume someone at Sony is doing the math actually correctly. But, <laughs> um, I, I just, I think they think it's too much of a risk. Although I think the public perception of this is backfiring because they raise prices and Xbox is just getting everything away on Game Pass. So mm -hmm. it's it's weird. So, well, I guess giving Sean Lane the benefit of the doubt, what would the solution be? Do you think that Xbox Game Pass is going to remain $9.99 a month? Or do you think... At some point, and then at what point, if you think this will happen, will the price be raised? They'll raise the price. I mean, it's it's Netflix. I'll, you know, it's the same thing. Like the they'll just slowly inch it up. Be like, ah, all the value we got, we're gonna. It's eleven bucks now, or thirteen bucks. Like mm -hmm. that is bound to happen in time. Um, and that's that's kind of inevitable with most subscription services. Uh, I think they're gonna leave it at this for a while because I think they really like the momentum they're building right now and they wouldn't want to curtail that with a price increase. But like, like, yeah, I think obviously someday they will increase the price of it. Um, in terms of Sony's response to it, like this is a question I ask myself a lot and like, I'm genuinely like confused as to what their course of action should be. I, I don't think raising next gen prices to 70 bucks or charging for upgrades to next gen and things like that. Like, I think they could have, been just fine with their $60 price tag staying the way it was because at least we wouldn't have this like even if they're maintaining the status quo they weren't actively making things more expensive or, or worse uh, but now we have this kind of very diametrically opposed narrative like I, I don't know what do you think they can do to match Game Pass or do they even need to at this point well I mean that rumor we talked about last week with Netflix potentially coming into play there 
I, 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 I'm not going to. <laughs> well, no, I'm I just refuse saying, to believe that's happening. Had that been a thing happening with yeah. Sony bringing their games to a service like Netflix, because Microsoft soon enough is going to be on televisions. So you're going to have to pair your controller to your television and you're going to be playing games. I was playing Sims 4 on a crappy old laptop that I have today, right? To deny that that technology is sort of cool and likely the way that we're going, or at least one of the many ways that uh, uh, companies can offer their consumers to play games, I'd say to deny anything like that is is a little foolish, right? You look at what Apple did. Apple offers gaming with their gaming with their boxes. Piece, uh, mobile games are looking better than ever, and now Microsoft is developing this streaming service that seems like it's going to be straight up in television soon. Sony is working on something for sure. They invested a ton of revenue into this idea. So I'm curious what it is. If it was building the infrastructure to stream like something like Netflix, I, I think that's cool. I think that's a really smart collaboration, honestly. But that kind of didn't go anywhere. Well, I, I could see them being, I, I don't know about Netflix. I can't, I, I can't see the Netflix thing. But in terms like what I could see Sony doing is is getting into the streaming game because game streaming does seem somewhat inevitable at this point. And like, yeah, you're not selling PlayStations, but I think what they could do is like, even if they're not adding, you know, all their games to Sony Game Pass or PS Now or whatever at launch, well, what they could start doing is if they get a streaming service up and running to compete with, you know, Xbox Cloud Gaming or whatever, mm -hmm. then you could get like a stream copy of whatever box copy you're buying. So like maybe they're not doing the full thing that Xbox is doing yeah. where everything's day one. But they could at least kind of move in that direction. We're like, okay, your seventy dollars is also getting you a cloud copy in addition to the one that goes on your PlayStation. And like, again, Microsoft is is doing better because they're also giving you a PC copy and a cloud copy, and it's on Game Pass. But like, at least that would kind of narrow the gap a little bit, and they would still get their sixty, seventy bucks for the original copy of the game. So like, this is where I can kind of see some sort of compromise happening. It's just, can they get a streaming service up? Can it? perform well like if they're you know if they're sony and they're not like a cloud company like yeah. i don't know i guess we'll see well they have a streaming service with playstation now all their playstation 3 games are streamed only um right except yeah. for like god of war 3 there's like a few handful that they like remastered or there's options there but uh yeah. for the most part all those games are streamed so they have the infrastructure built and it's all ps3 though right like or PS4, like PS3, it's not current the entire stuff. PS3, because yeah. there's an issue with the architecture of the console where I think right. they weren't able to do physical down or downloads. Um, okay. But yeah, so that one is streamed. They have the technology. I believe it's built on on live, which was one of the early, early people that sort of tried the streaming thing and didn't work is out. Is that a good thing? <laughs> well, they started with that, but I mean, come yeah. on, they're not still using that same code that was right. back then. They've, probably hired people from Google, hired people who have worked on these streaming services. To answer your question though, like what could Sony do? I think they need a partner. They need to partner with somebody to bring their services out. And then um, if it's subscription-based, like the way PlayStation Now is, I honestly think that would be a good start, but it's not really a super attractive headline, right? PlayStation I Now mean, is streamable on your television. Most people are sort of eh on PlayStation Now right now. Going back to the Netflix idea, like. In theory, that is a very good distribution idea. Like, yeah. it's just the only way I can see that working where, like, so like Sony wouldn't totally freak out is if Netflix wrote them, like, the world's largest check for that to happen. Like, billions of dollars. Like, because I, I can't see them doing some sort of, like, revenue split on, like, games that are, are coming to, to their something. It, it would have to be kind of a truly massive deal. And, like, I don't know. Netflix spends so much on content. Like, I guess it's not impossible, but... That this seems like something that might happen in like four or five years rather because like I think they're just spooling up now with their whole gaming idea in the first place. So if that did happen, it would be a long time from now. And by then, maybe Sony will already have something, you know, more set up for like modern day streaming. Yeah, I'm not sure. But to rein it back in sort of to the original question about Xbox and will they raise prices? I think they stay at nine ninety nine at least for the next like, I don't know, I'll say something crazy. I'll say five years. They stay five nine, years. Nine, I was going to say two years. Well, but okay. they have to like establish that it's a quality service. So yeah. once they once they've done that for a substantial amount of time, like Netflix didn't raise their prices for years. 
they they were in service for quite a significant amount of time at that 999 price point and only recently did they start raising it in the last few years once they had like had a massive user base which xbox is still in their spinning up phase xbox has had a great last few quarters the last two quarters did like 15 billion so that's good they are in second place against sony or third place technically if you had nintendo you know in terms of hardware sales. overall yeah mm-hmm. yeah but like the thing is sony or xbox has a more diversified portfolio than sony sony has pointed out that that is one of their goals to work towards and then uh there is this quote i had from let me just make sure i got it right working casual taking a step back to the company overall microsoft as a whole company microsoft posts some staggering results in the scheme of things over 46 billion in the fourth quarter revenue that's an increase of 21 percent and they're well ahead of uh analyst estimate of 44.2 billion so they've already like shattered all expectations this is microsoft though this isn't just xbox so this is this massive company on the xbox side they have the backing to do sort of whatever and satya nadella as you probably heard basically said we're all in on games the xbox series s and x are our fastest selling consoles ever with more consoles sold life to date than any previous generation and sony released their press release today today the day after the microsoft earnings call touting how They've also sold more consoles to date, and it's the fastest selling console ever. Both of these companies are just breaking records. I, I think it's to be celebrated just, just through and through. But I heard console gaming was dying uh, at the end of this generation. Who said that? Oh, Every, that was that was everybody the not in the industry right? said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I it's gonna be interesting to see where console gaming goes. If the streaming, if the streaming technology is solid, I do see it taking off but you still have a large amount of people who don't have the internet access to do stuff like that. So we'll see where that goes. And it's still not like just good enough for a lot of people, like Mm -hmm. with fidelity or input, like it's, it's just not enough for, to be like your mainstream thing. If you can afford a console, like you're still probably going to want to do that because you're still probably doing most of your gaming at home in the same place, the majority of the time. So I think that's still, an appealing prospect for like 95% of gamers. So, <laughs> uh, do you think, how long do you think this is trend is going to continue? Both consoles are selling insanely well. They're both breaking their personal records. Sony is definitely ahead of Xbox. Like there's no denying that they're doing great. They're releasing great titles. Uh, Xbox is doing great in terms of services. You know, they're, I think they're trying to diversify their portfolio, like I said, but how long is this going to go on? Some people are saying this is going to go all the way till 2022. What's your take, Paul? In terms of do you these mean insane the sales, short, shortage, the sales or shortages? Because that's well, the question. All of this where, is happening during shortage, which is nuts. No, right? I know that's what I mean. Yeah. It's like yeah. because yeah, like when is supply going to meet demand, and yeah. where is the ceiling on that? Like, how are they? I wrote about this today. Like, how are they doing this? Well, they're supply limited, and what would they have done if they weren't? And like, I, I think you're right. I think supply shortages are going to go into 2022, probably. I don't at least halfway through the year. And so once that happens, and that we're also going to be heading into by 2022, you have that huge slate of Xbox games, some of which will already be out. And then you'll have Starfield at the end and then whatever they put in the middle there. Mm-hmm. And then maybe Sony on Sony's side, you have Horizon, you have God of War, you have a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so like it's, it's really going to be taking off at that point. And I mean, I would not be surprised to see by the end of this generation, this being Xbox's best generation or at least close to like the 360 um sony i mean sony has done so well with so many consoles i don't i don't know but like the pace that this is going now sure like i i could see you know if this continues i don't know why it would taper off all of a sudden and you know the the greater population of the world is increasing you know gaming so i i don't really see a reason it would go down unless they just all of a sudden nosedive in, in quality for some reason, which I, just, yeah, I don't see happening. Happen. So I, I I would expect records to continue to be broken for speed for at mm-hmm. least at least the next couple of years, if not the whole generation. I mean, we you know, who knows? I think I think one thing like you have to give Sony props. Their launch window was probably one of the best launch windows I've ever seen in gaming, period. They had Ratchet and Clank. They had Marvel's Spider-Man, Miles Morales. 
Uh, what else, Paul? Like just Returnal was they great. Had Godfall. Uh... <laughs> no, 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 the good stuff. Like, no, they had a lot of good yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, which it, is launch windows are usually just pretty vacant of like most good stuff. Um, so uh, that that Demon really Souls stood out. Remaster, yeah, yeah, and like it, and it didn't help that Microsoft was supposed to have a really strong launch window with Infinite, and then they they canceled that, and then I mean they didn't really have anything. Like obviously, there's a lot of great games you can play on Xbox. It's just you know everything got pushed where sony delivered all their stuff right at once and Mm -hmm. they're also good at pacing out their content to a certain extent and like while we don't have like their long long long-term plans they're probably still going to keep doing that but xbox is now essentially catching up as of this fall where they have forza and halo and then they're going to get on a regular cadence of probably really good games so they'll both be pretty even in that regard i would assume um and then that'll that'll be a big difference from last generation where Xbox was just not really delivering at the same pace as Sony. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, all these games have to actually be good. Like Starfield has to be good, things like that. But I don't think it's an unreasonable assumption, you know, given how many of these games are are shaping up that that will happen. Yeah, it seems like that has all started with Flight Simulator and then later Ascent. I think Ascent comes out next week, which is it's looking good, but time will tell. Um, And it's interesting because right now Sony seems to be relying on director's cuts to sort of fill this time where we don't know if Horizon Zero Dawn is going to hit now. And now they had one of their heavy hitters need to be delayed, God of War, which is the right move. But it does kind of it does kind of make this window for Sony where, OK, well, now we're in the space that Xbox was in earlier, but it do- I don't think that's going to matter for them at all. They've set the tone that they have great games, and they're going to spend the time to make sure those are quality games when you buy them. And I think, I think the, the whole director's cut thing, I think they saw an opportunity to fill that gap and they've taken it with that service. Would you like, I think it's sort of flipped right now. I think Xbox is now set up to have consistent game releases for the through December, at least. Right. And then from there, We'll see. We'll see where everybody lands because we don't even know if Horizon is still 2021. Yeah, but... Horizon's a big question. Yeah. They say it is, but I I could see them delaying it just because you know they don't want to screw it up, like, and yeah, they course. would delay it out of the window because, like, and they should. That's honest, the right. Move. Yeah. Well, honestly, yeah. from their perspective, like, who cares? Like, they're going to mm-hmm. be sold out of PS5s all through the holiday anyway. It's not like they need a game to drive sales at this point because just everybody wants a PS5. Um, I mean, director's cut. Like, I, I hate like the packaging of the director's cut and like the nomenclature. Like, what what is actually being delivered in terms of like it's an expansion for Ghost of Tsushima? That's awesome. I wish they would just call it an expansion for Ghost of Tsushima rather than director's cut, where it's got features it's supposed to have already for PS5 mm-hmm. and there's additional content. Like, I, I just find the packaging annoying, and I think they're going to do this with a couple different games. They're already doing it with a couple, but whatever like fundamentally like i think that's still a, a good thing and i think you know uh tsushima is going to be a significant revenue generator for them when that comes out and i don't know you know the full extent of games will do this for but i mean i could see them doing that with honestly last of us maybe even so i i'm I, it's kind of a stopgap but i i don't know even if even if horizon is delayed and microsoft does have a better fall again we're at a period where everyone is selling out of everything forever so i'm not sure how much that matters in the grand scheme of things yeah well bringing up the director's cuts things like that i agree i think icky island looks amazing i think i'm really excited to play ghost of Tsushima on ps5 you know i've been involved with this whole conversation about 70 dollars games <laughs> do you want to weigh in on that or would you rather not I'd <laughs> rather not. So I, well, I, I want to make sure you have an out. I don't. I don't think it's a very like controversial opinion to say that that sucks. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I don't know. Like and maybe it is among like hardcore Sony people, but I, I, you can use the argument of like game prices have not gone up in a bazillion years, whatever. But like, there's also a million more sources of revenue within the gaming industry between subscriptions and microtransactions and. DLC, like, I, I, I don't think that is an effective argument to say, like, games need to cost this much now. And, like, Microsoft is just totally undercut, undercutting that entire concept by offering, you know, everything on Game Pass for 10, 15 bucks a month. And it just, it, it is hard for Sony to make the case that, like, yeah, this version of the game needs to cost $10 more than that version of the game 
for reasons. Like, and, yeah, they, there's just no coherent argument, really. Yeah, and honestly, I think it causes a tricky marketing thing for the companies making these games. Like the thing that I'm constantly in hot water about is the the Ghost of Tsushima marketing, which may, leaves you feeling and has left a lot of people feeling like, oh, wait, so I have to pay $10 to use the features of my console. And that's been hard to convey because people are like, oh, you don't want to support the developers. They have to do extra work for the console, so you should have to pay 10 extra dollars. And then the other... Well, the arguments are this, and let me just say it as plainly as possible. Uh, people are willing, A, to pay $10 for what they perceive as a high level of quality product. And I totally understand that. And they also want to make sure that the developer is supported for that extra development time of these features that the console offers. But then inversely, if, if you look at what both consoles are doing, like stuff like 4K at 60, that's free on Xbox, right? but that's in the marketing materials for a game like Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima is already making something that's worth 30 bucks. Like, so they're in this weird spot. I mean, spot it just should have been where, an expansion. That's yeah, all they needed to say. <laughs> they're in this totally weird, bizarre spot yeah. where they're saying like, oh, the 10 extra dollars, well, you're paying to use your controller and you're paying for that. But that's a very odd message to send to your consumer base. And well, that's it's what, undercut that's, by a lot of other games because yeah. there, there are other games that have done next gen versions that have either been the same price or just a free upgrade if you already own it. Like, say what you will about CDPR is like from the start, they said the next gen version of Cyberpunk, which is coming this fall allegedly, <laughs> is going to be a free upgrade. So, like, how do you jive? Like, okay, you, you have the $70 version of Ghost of Tsushima, but Cyberpunk for all its issues is a free upgrade and like it is going to be a next gen version. Like, it's it's not really an argument that is coherent other than like we want a better profit margin. Like that's the only thing that really mm -hmm. kind of makes sense here. Yeah, and and that's that's the weird thing. Like I just I I don't understand it. I want to I would love to hear from Sony like maybe they've talked about it. I should probably look it up like why do you feel that the $70 value is and they bring up the inflation argument. But like they're okay, going to bring up a lot of your, BS is what they're Yeah, your, your competitor is still doing 60. Uh, who else is doing 70? EA and Activision? No, not EA. 2K uh, and Activision not, are, right? Not Ubisoft. 2K Activision, and Activision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so but, anyway, that, that's just sort of, it's just confusing to me. Not really, like, it just seems like, we well, we want 10 extra dollars, so give it to us. Yeah, you know, essentially. Like, I'm totally willing to pay you $30. But if you're telling me well, I, pay, I paid ten dollars to use the five hundred dollar console I bought, that's the weird thing to me, and I, I, can't, just, I can't get past it. Like, no, it, it's yeah. weird. It continues to be weird because, mm -hmm. like, I, I I wrote an article about this, but I got yelled at about where like I I I really enjoyed Ratchet and Clank, and yet when I went to buy it myself because I didn't get a review code, like I I, I balked at seventy dollars. I'm like, is this? is this going to be worth $70? And like, I, I played it, I beat it. It was great. And yet I can see why that price would make some people balk at a game like that or Returnal, where it's like, okay, God of War 2, obviously that is, you, you can make a much easier case for like, that's worth $70, quote unquote. Yeah. So like, what... even, even if it is only $10 more, it's like this mental thing that mm -hmm. just seems very strange now. While you start weighing things like, okay, Ratchet and Clank, everybody would say is a phenomenal looking game. They did amazing things with the technology. How long was it? Long. <laughs> yeah, so now you yeah. start questioning every little facet of a product. Mm -hmm. How long is it? Am I getting $70 worth if I play for four hours, right? Um, I or, thought Godfall was $70. Yeah, it's Godfall like an $70, <laughs> and yeah. uh, that didn't go over great. So I, I feel like it could hurt games, too. Like, I, I bet Returnal was 70 bucks, right? Yes, it was. Yeah, and so like, I bet that game got that. hurt. Housemark yeah. didn't know about that until they saw it on the shelf, basically. It's oh, really? weird. Yeah. Like, I bet that game would have been... It sold half a million copies, which is good. It, it was a lot lower than the other games, but, like, it's, that seems like a game that would have done really well at 50 bucks or something. Like, not 70... I, I don't know. That just... It, it struck me as weird that, like, even a game like that would be 70 bucks. It's a great game, don't get me wrong, but, like, I think a, the price point hurts games like that when they're being compared to like God of War 2. And like, again, I know, I guess we went through all this with $60, but it seems like the moral of the story for a lot of people has been like, okay, well, let's price games differently. Like Overwatch is cheaper than, you know, a $60 game, like things like that. And instead Sony's like, I don't know, we're just gonna make everything cost 70 bucks. Like if it's first party, which I don't <laughs> think all first party or console exclusive games are, are created equal. 
and I think we have seen many examples of this already in some games that have probably been actively hurt, um, probably in terms of overall revenue because of that. So I, I can't prove that, I guess, but that is the feeling I have. Well, everything's doing crazy well. Like they they listed all these properties. I, I would agree that as much as I love Returnal, like I'm happy to pay $70 for that one because it was like, it's probably still a game yeah. of the year contender for me, but there's the perception portion to this. When you're telling somebody out there, Returnal's great. Oh yeah, what is it? Okay, it's a, a roguelike where you go in and you shoot stuff. Yeah, how much is it? Yeah. 70. 70 for a roguelike? You know, it's about it's about genres and a perception there that I think will shift. I think it's going to shift more towards the $70 model, even though I feel weird about it. Like, I just think that's yeah, where probably. we're going to go. Yeah. Well, I don't know, though, because... I mean, because, you know, free to play is a huge thing in many markets. Oh, and yeah. then Game Pass is not free to play, I guess, but it is like you're not paying these giant box copy prices. So, like, those are the trends that are also kind of, you know, rising and expanding quickly. So, like, to have this, like, really expensive, you know, box copy, it just, it's just, it's starting to feel, I mean, it's, it already, it's only been a couple of months, technically, but, like, it feels very outdated compared to, where the industry is moving in other directions. Like I think Sony's huge budget, big development games, like I think they have always wanted to charge more for them because they think they are worth more than, you know, competitors that are not as long or not as high quality or whatever. But translating that to the current state of the market is tricky. And like, what, what was the game that sold the most copies by a metric ton? Miles Morales, which is not a $70 game. <laughs> so yeah. like, I, I don't know. I, I guess we can see how this unfolds, and I doubt. I kind of doubt that they'll reverse. Are you sure Miles, on this, Miles Morales wasn't seventy? If it include, if if I think if you got the bundle with Spider Man and Miles Morales, but if you just bought Miles Morales, I thought it was either forty or fifty. I, think I don't 50. remember. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was fifty, but it wasn't. Just Miles Morales was not seventy for sure. I ninety nine percent sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, also, with Spider Man is more recognizable, but. I, I think the point kind of stands that. there and I am not looking forward to kind of just endless $70 games from PlayStation for like six years. Let's see if Paul was right. Oh, There's going to be a new segment. Let's fact check it. All right. So how much was Spider-Man Miles Morales? Uh, I don't know. It looks like it's listed at 63.90. I don't know. Let's look on Amazon PS4. PS4 uh, and PS5. It was 50 marked down to 35. Ha. So it launched at 50. Now, Ultimate Edition was 70, which Included is... Well, yeah, so games? Ultimate inclu included Spider-Man Remastered. That's but just Miles Morales was 50. And now it's... Phenomenal game. Time. Phenomenal yeah. game. Was it not... was? I mean, it was pretty short. It was, it was the same length as Godfall, probably, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. I never yeah. realized that. I'm glad you brought it up. Paul was right. That uh, was the conclusion. I love this time. segment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this segment, we can just call it Paul was right. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the long and the short of it, that's that's largely all we wanted to talk about this episode. It's it's definitely interesting to sort of think about where both of these consoles are at. They're both doing amazingly well, which is just great to see. Right. Um, I think Sony has some marketing challenges to figure out. And largely that's because they're trying to be. They don't want to give up their 100 million install base on the PlayStation 4, so they want to make sure that most of those games are offered. Pretty soon, we are we are already getting some next-gen only games like Ratchet and Clank and such that are just, hey, it's if it's on PS5 only, it's $70. Okay. Like that's understandable. Like they've made they've made that stance, right? I think mm -hmm. that's easier for me to digest. You've made it very clear you're charging 70 for all your first parties. Sure. The issue comes in where you're re-releasing a game like with Ghost of Tsushima and you're saying, well, the re-release is going to cost a little bit more on PlayStation 5 than it is on PlayStation 4. Whereas for so long, like it's just been one price for all, right? That's where, yeah. that's where I think it just gets in a very weird territory. I think they're both bad in different ways, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess we won't have to deal well, with one of them for too, wanna, too much longer. Well, what, which one would well, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? No, I just mean, I, you know, I, I think getting a fixed $70 price point for every first party game, no matter what going forward is not great in and of itself. Like I get that, that, that is a kind of robust stance they're taking, but 
I still don't love it. <laughs> and I don't think that's the way the market is moving outside of Sony. Um, but I also agree with you with the separate point that upgrades that are just kind of using things the console should be doing anyway should not cost $10 by themselves. Yeah. All right. Well, Paul, normally this is where I say, and this is to the death, and then we show the fatality, but... Uh, we just, run out of fatalities. Yeah. Okay. So just a little <laughs> behind the scenes. Those take me way too long to do. I don't and, know why you wanted like, to do that the, much work on that. Because it's first called place. Paul versus Destin, and I thought it would be fun, right? <laughs> okay. it's, like, it was fun. <laughs> just give some for the viewer. So we're going to play a yep. montage uh, for the outro this time, but uh, I think we're just going to move on to conversations from now on. Thank you for watching, everybody. Here you go. Finish him. Outstanding. <laughs> Finish him. Ah! Ah! Fatality. Outstanding. <laughs> Finish him. Fatality. Outstanding. Finish him. Friendship. Friendship. Time. Finish him. Friendship. Friendship. Let's go. Finish him. Fatality. Outstanding. <laughs> Finish him. Fatality. Outstanding. <laughs> hey thank you so much for watching as always at the end of these videos i say please subscribe hit that bell and this time is no different there i have a goal for the channel post a video every day and hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year i already got the spot for this for the button right there that's where it's gonna go. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like it, seriously, hit that sub button, hit that bell, check out Paul Tassi also. I'll put up his his icon where my sub button's gonna go. <laughs> if we get there, when we get there, we will get there. And uh, if you wanna become a member, memberships are turned on, thank you so much. To all the people who have said, hey Dustin, I like your content enough to back you as a member. I really, really appreciate it. And of course I have a merch store, launch some merch. Thank you so much to everybody who has actually said, hey, yeah, you know what? I like that, let's give it a shot. Uh, check it out if you're interested and I will catch you for the next one. Bye everybody.